Hi, this is Lily Hubbard, and this is a continuation of my other videos about my testimony. But you can watch this video, and then if you feel led to, you can go back and watch the other three parts. So this is from my YouTube channel, Lily Hubbard, L-I-L-L-Y-H-U-B-B-A-R-D. -D. And this is about the Holy Spirit, how the Holy Spirit can bring revelation and healing to your brain and to your heart and to your life. And this is my testimony, the power of the Holy Spirit. So where I left off before after on part three is that I got filled with the Holy Spirit on Christmas Day 2016. I'm preparing Christmas dinner for my restaurant in Thailand and the Holy Spirit descended down on me for a few minutes where I felt supernatural ecstasy and then I just felt joy throughout the rest of the day. So much peace, so much peace. So the next morning I woke up and I felt like a different person and I could hear a voice saying, Lily, I know you have been searching for truth this entire time and now I'm about to give you all the truth you ever desired. And then something happened in my brain, something unlocked, and all of the memories started coming back. All of these suppressed memories. And it was, oh my gosh, it was so overwhelming. It was, I don't really have words for it, but what I realized is that I had multiple personality disorder as I had compartmentalized my whole life. And this had happened because of trauma that I experienced. I almost died when I was young. I was almost murdered and there were some horrific things that happened to my family and to my father, to my grandparents that were coming down my family line. And I had been researching this stuff for years. I had been researching mind control, government mind control, MK Ultra. And I had never, I, had ne I didn't never understood that this had happened to me and to my family. I was really into aliens and the alien deception. And I think that was just a delusion from that reality to not let me focus on, on the real truth, which is that these things are entities that take over ourselves, our minds, and there are demons, spirit, spirits that come in and infect us and they come down our family lines. So multiple personality disorders, also known as DID, Dis Dissociative Identity Disorder, and it's from trauma that happens to you. And I had been under trauma, so much trauma, because I grew up in a demonic house, demon infest house. And the trauma that happened to my grandfather that was coming down or my family line, like I said, continued to cause more fractures in my brain. So I'm going to go back to talk about what happened to my grandfather because my grandfather was definitely a victim of MKUltra. So MKUltra was a government program that took place after World War II when the military, the CIA, and other mil government um, agencies recruited Nazi scientists from after World War II who had been doing mind control experiments on the Jewish people. They came, they were recruited to the U.S. under Project Paperclip to do mind control experiments on Canadian and U.S. citizens in the government agencies, military, uh, universities, and mental hospitals. So my entire family grew up outside of Washington, D.C. My grandfather met and fell in love with my grandmother when he was 19 and she was 20. And a year after they got married, he started developing signs of schizophrenia. He was talking to apparitions, things that weren't there. And he was becoming increasingly violent to the point where they had to institutionalize him. And at the institution he went to, like I said, outside of DC, he was receiving electroshock therapy every weekend and only God knows what else what they were doing to him. 
So if you know about schizophrenia on a spiritual level, schizophrenics have no veil to protect them from the spiritual realm. So they can see into the spirits, into the spiritual side, and they can see the de demons that we're not supposed to see with our eyes. And so I believe, you know, the he was a candidate for them to do mind control experiments on. He was in this mental hospital for about 10 years on and off. And when he finally got out, he had the mind of a four-year-old. And I knew him as kind of a funny but broken person, like a child, right? A young child. And you couldn't have a conversation with him. It was very just, he was very simple. And my grandmother, she always stuck by him. She always, she was a strong Christian, a Holy Spirit filled woman. She had, a, she was, there was a simplicity about her. She has a simple mind, but she was just a lovely, sweet, loving, caring woman. And she refused to divorce him or she always stood by him, even though she knew he was always sick and was never going to be um, a functioning adult person. And she would take my dad and my dad's older brother to the mental hospital every weekend. And I think this had a lot of a huge traumatic effect on my dad. And I wouldn't be surprised if they were doing mind control experiments on him. And as he got older, he became increasingly unstable and he passed away about 11 years ago under traumatic circumstances. So I know that when my grandfather got out of, my grandfather was in the, in the mental hospital throughout the 50s, you know, at the height of Project Paperclip. And when he got out, this was really hard on my dad. And I know that my dad, I heard stories, my dad always, skipping school and hiding under the bed and I believe well I know he was teased by his fellow classmates and teachers and I believe when he was hiding under the bed he was also dissociating which caused him to have multiple personality disorder and probably the spirits that were in my grandfather and attacked my grandfather probably jumped into my father so my dad married my mom when my mom was about 19, he was 25, and soon after they opened a restaurant together, and they were very successful. It was in downtown Annapolis, and they seemed to live a really good life. And my, my earliest years growing up, we had a really good life. We remember going out to restaurants, going out to nice, going on nice vacations, and everything seemed to be pretty good. But I also had, growing up, had really horrible dreams about running from things in slow motion, running away in slow motion, being chased by, by things that I didn't know of. And I always heard voices in my head. And I've talked to my sisters and they also had really terrible nightmares. Because the house that we lived in, I, some of the dreams I, have, I can still recall to this day, and I, looking at these, re-examining these dreams by the power of the Holy Spirit, I can see how, wow, this house that we grew up in was so demon infested, so demonic. And there was one story that happened where a powerful entity moved into our house when I was about one years old. So this story was told to us throughout our childhood. My dad loved to tell the story. It was like a, like a party trick kind of, because he would tell it at parties, dinner parties to his friends and it was called the poltergeist story and we were never allowed we'd always quest, ask questions about the story but we were never allowed to talk about the story at family functions so it was like very secret hush hush and at the time it was during after right after that movie poltergeist came out and my dad loved horror movies and he would make us watch horror movies from when i was just a toddler and he he would make us watch these scary movies and when we cry like or got up scared he would just laugh and but even though I say that my dad was still a loving father too um, so the poltergeist story my aunt my great-aunt my dad's aunt my grandmother's my dad's mother's 
sister, she worked for the NSA, right? And she started to experience paranormal activity in her home. And she was a single mom with, I think, a 12-year-old son, one son. And she was calling my dad, asking him for help, but he obviously didn't know how to help her. She was saying, like, things were moving around her house. She felt like there was a presence in her house that she made her uncomfortable and scared her and I, he eventually told her to you know call the police I think she was reluctant to call the police because her job at the NSA she was afraid like if they found out they might she would might get fired so the police came and they couldn't find anything obviously and then it got increasingly worse until there were knives being picked up or just thrown across across the room into the walls and at that, when that happened, she was so scared. She called my dad and begged him if she could come stay with him, us. And so he said yes. And the next thing, they are pulled. They pull up in their car, and she's jumped out of the car, and she's just screaming. They've chased us. They've chased us. They followed us here. And this freaks my mom and dad out. Like I am one years old. My older sister's four years old. So they come into the house, saying that that whatever thing whatever entity was at their home and followed them here they said they got into the car and the garage door slammed up and down and didn't want them to leave the garage and then on the way there all of the car doors flew open the car was acting crazy and they could feel that w that the entity was in their car so my parents just try to calm them down and they go to sleep on the in the living room and in the middle of the night, my mom and dad wake up and they hear a swoosh across the bedroom, their bedroom. And it was my diaper, my baby diaper picked up and flew across the bedroom. So this is pre-internet, pre-Google. So the next day they look in the back of the newspaper and it says, there's a, in the yellow pages, there's an ad, oh, are you experiencing paranormal activity? Please call this number. So my dad calls this number and this little lady and two other men come and they have this machine they're going around and my parents are like laughing at, about the story because this little woman looks just like the old woman from that movie poltergeist and they couldn't believe it like they thought that was so funny or strange right and they're going around and they just i don't know exactly what they said but they just said oh it's just baby came in from the boy i don't know what happened and but it doesn't seem like it's here now, so you could just, you know, don't worry. If anything happens, you can call us back. And then they leave. My aunt leaves. And that's the end of the story. And that was the end. And I was just thought, we just thought that was a funny, crazy story. We kind of loved that story. It was like our family ghost story, right? So, you know, once I got filled with the Holy Spirit on that day, I realized like that thing that came into our house was not paranormal activity. That was a demon and it wanted into our wanted to come into our house and it wanted to be in my our family and that we would be a perfect vessel or candidate for it. I don't know if the government had done something to my aunt that conjured this up. I don't know how this thing what where this thing came from, but I know it wanted to be in our house. And I know from my dreams from the experiences that I had in that house, which a lot of are blurry, I've blocked a lot of it out. This house was just such a dark darkness to it. And what I'm about to tell you too, things just got increasingly demonic. But we did have a break for a while. My, when I was six years old, my, my parents sold their restaurant and their dream was to move to the Caribbean, to go live on an island and start a, a, new, a business, like a bread and, bed and breakfast. And the plan was that me, my older sister, my mom who was pregnant, and my dad's mother, my grandmother, we would move to the island of St. Bart's. We moved there and my dad would stay with my grandfather to renovate our house in Maryland. So... We had a year and a half there on St. Bart's, and this year was a blessing to be out of that house, but also very difficult on us because my dad was gone, and we missed him so much. And finally, we came back from St. Bart's, and our house, the house was just completely destroyed, basically, because my dad had been renovating it, and it did look beautiful on the outside in some ways, but it was so 
it was decaying in every way too like it was just falling apart it seemed like every project everything my dad did he could never finish it and it was just there was just a cold presence in this house it felt like it was decaying it felt dirty like there was one bathroom and it was on the, the bottom floor and we were stayed on the third floor so you'd have to walk all the way down the steps to this basement floor to go to the bathroom there was an infestation of crickets there that were like the dis most disgusting crickets you've ever seen like to this day i don't I've never seen crickets like this they looked like alien crickets and my dad loved that movie aliens um yeah so the one good thing about this house is that it was in a neighborhood called Joyous Lane, and it was the most beautiful neighborhood you could ever imagine living in. There were ravines, trees, forests to play in, and my older sister and I would just go off and explore in nature for hours. My parents just let us go, and we really had, it was amazing to be so connected with nature. You know, I think that's what really saved us in so many ways. There were farms and pastures and horses and there was a beach with sand dunes in the summer that we'd play on and in the winter we would go sledding and ice skating. So the nature just kept us like, kept it from being so bad that we were, or kept us from being so tormented we, and it forced us to get outside. So the, my parents' relationship was deteriorating as the money problems got worse and worse. And my dad started a construction business and at this point my dad was so unstable mentally emotionally in every way and I just remember him having my grandfather my grandfather and my grandmother were living at this house with us and my grandfather like I said had the mind of a four-year-old but he was helping my dad doing construction work you know picking up pieces of wood moving things cement and stuff and my dad just raging and my grandfather cursing at him, screaming at him. My dad had so much rage in him and that was scary. So my dad had started this construction company and he was doing work for people and then he was hiring ex-convicts and then not paying them. And so these convicts started calling our house, threatening us and threatening to murder us, murder my dad and our whole family. And we were also getting bill collectors calling. So for like a couple of years, we were not allowed to answer the phone. And to this day, I still have problems with answering the phone. I actually don't even use a phone or have a phone number that people can call me on because I just really don't like to answer the phone or talk on the phone. So these men were calling and they were leaving messages on a open voice recorder that they had back in those days so you could hear what they were saying and they would just scream that they were going to come kill us and this just didn't phase my dad at all like he just was like oh it was the wrong number but it really obviously just terrified us and my mom and this happened one time when my dad wasn't there and it was just my mom and my older and younger sister and we actually ran out of the house. My mom called my grandmother to come pick us up, her mother. And we like ran, ran along the road, had to hide in the woods and would take turns, my sister and I, looking out for my grandmother's car. And she came to pick us up so we were okay. And then it happened again when my dad was there. And my mom was at work. My mom was working like two jobs supporting us and my dad was just trying to work and complete the house. and. Like I said, there, he was never going to complete this house. This house had infected his mind. And, yeah. So, when these men called, then my dad told us to, whatever we do, don't answer the, answer the door. And he left. I know he was trying to get his car out of the driveway so they didn't, so they thought that no one was home. And he told us to stay there. The Holy Spirit has revealed this to me. He told us to stay there because he thought that he would have greater mercy on us if we were alone than if we were in the car with him. And he didn't want us to be murdered all together or him murdered in front of us. So they came to the door and they started to break down the door. And my older sister and I, she, my older sister, we, she hid us all in the closet. The three of us were hiding in the closet. And then all of a sudden, 
and my older sister stands up and goes to the door and I'm like what are I couldn't even believe it it's took taken me like this memory came back to me and I really didn't understand it and but after I released my testimony before I got revelation on why my sister stood up to go to the door and how my sister has a, a angelic anointing on her voice which soothes spirits and people and when she got up and to go speak to the those men the holy holy spirit strengthened her then and she spoke to the men and begged them to leave us alone my dad wasn't there please go away and they did so the holy spirit had been in around us and protecting us through all of this dark time and i think that this was because of my grandmother who had been praying for us and was god was listening to her prayers and we I've talked about this with my sister, older sister, about how like we always felt like, looking back, we always felt like we were protected by the Holy Spirit. So when she did this, she was literally willing to die for my younger sister and I, and that really took its toll on her in, a, in the spirit, you know. And God also revealed to me that if she hadn't have done this, that those men would have broken down the door because there was so much anger and rage and there were so many, many demons in that house that if they had walked through the door, through the entrance, they would have been filled with demonic rage, insanity and murder. And they would have murdered all three of us and maybe worse. So praise the Lord that we were protected and, and praise the Lord for the strength that my sister had and her obedience to God when she got up and saved my sisters and I. So after that, my dad came back and yeah, that was really traumatic. We were all very upset and my memory still blurred about that. But my dad ended up getting arrested for embezzlement. He made the front cover of the Capitol newspaper in Annapolis. And our family was publicly shamed and I went to school the next day after that newspaper article came out and my teacher I had such a lovely teacher I'll never forget her name her name was mrs. Gibbs and I knew she felt for me I just had my head down all day and I had just said I had a really bad stomach ache and I think she just she didn't she felt I knew she had so much compassion for me and I she didn't really know what to do but she said oh you need to just go to the psychiatrist because I thought she thought like that would be good for me she had good intentions for that but I went to the psychiatrist and this lady was not a nice woman and she was just asked trying to she was just trying to find information about what happened and she was like well we all know what happened with your dad and I don't know if he's in jail or not I don't know the whole story it was like she was just like wanted to get gossip from me and this hurt me so much and I went back home crying and I told my mom and my dad and my, my dad was so so angry and I knew it took a lot of strength for him to do what he did and he wrote this whole letter out to the school and I know that this something about the psychiatrist must have triggered him and he, and um, it triggered something in him from what happened to him when he was young, I think, with what happened to, with his experiences at, at the mental hospital visiting my grandfather or what happened to him at school from being teased about my grandfather. So he marched into school with me and he confronted the, the principal and the principal was such a really good man. When I look back at him, I could just see that he had the Holy Spirit on him. And he actually didn't even know anything about the newspaper article or about my dad, but he definitely calmed my dad down. And they confronted the psychiatrist and I guess reprimanded her, I don't know. And so we eventually lost the house, it was repossessed, and this was really traumatic on us and it was devastating because as much as this house tormented us, it's still like we loved it. It was our, I lived there for the first nine and a half years of my life. And I always thought, oh, one day I'm gonna work hard and I'm gonna save money, I'm gonna buy this house back. Because I knew nothing else, right? And 
as I will continue the story into my adulthood, like those spirits, they don't really, they don't exactly live in a house, even though I do feel like this house was cursed from what I know. No one lives in that house today. There's demonic possession, pres or there's demons in that house, okay? But demons don't want to be in a home. They don't want to be in a location. They prefer to be in a human. And so I'm going to end this part one of this. And there will be a part two coming out soon, I hope. And I just want to say that all of this information was revealed to me by the Holy Spirit. If I didn't have the Holy Spirit in me, I would not be able to have to know this. Like I had said in the beginning of, I had been, of the video, I had been studying MK Ultra, mind control, you know, delving into these conspiracies, but never did I, could I ever understand that this had happened to my family. Like I knew my grandfather was in a mental hospital. That was, it's like common knowledge to everyone in my family. And I knew he had, was getting electroshock therapy and it was all outside of DC. And besides my parents, my mom and dad were not in the military, but every single person basically on both sides of my family who are in the military or worked for the defense department had some contact, contacts with the, the military. And so I'm just, I feel so blessed to be able to share this with you. And I know compared to other people, my story is like nothing compared to the suffering that other people have gone through because I, I went, what I went through was really just demonic. I've never been sexually abused as a child and it, my parents were not involved in satanic ritual abuse at all, but we were all tormented and we all are victims. So I don't blame my dad. I don't blame my gran grandfather. I could see how like this just happens and I praise the Lord for this revelation so I can stop this. I can stop this ancestral curse that's gone down my family line and I can stop it happening to my own son and my own family. And I want to know, I want to tell you that everyone goes through trauma growing up and everyone at some levels has to dissociate from this trauma just to function. And, but when we don't deal with the past and our trauma, it just keeps happening and we keep hurting ourselves through the desires of our flesh, like overeating, drinking, you know, alcoholism, addiction to drugs, um, sex addiction, anything that makes us, gives us a temporary relief. But all these things just bring death and destruction to our souls because we do have a hole in our heart until we're willing to recognize what the Lord has done for us and how he died on the cross and by giving our lives to, to the Lord and repenting of our sins we are healed and we get to be filled with the Holy Spirit which is a gift it's a gift and it's been two and a half years since I gave my life to the Lord and since then it's been a journey and it has not been all about blessings. I have been persecuted, I have been attacked, but I can now look back and I see how God was always there even through that persecution and now I can actually praise the Lord for this persecution because it helped teach me about myself and helped teach me about my family and what we had gone through and it helped teach me about the spiritual realm and gave me the gift of discernment of the spirits and so now I can bind those spirits and rebuke them and I can release heaven down onto earth through my prayers and I want you to know that you can all have the same power too because in Jesus in the Lord there is power and authority and we are not victims okay I know that's really hard but we're not victims. We have all the power and authority to rebuke this and step into being powerful warriors for God because we do live in a spiritual, we are born into a spiritual war that we cannot see. But through the Holy Spirit, we have the strength to conquer these spirits. And it's written that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So I'm going to say a prayer before I end this video. Shut up, 
So I speak to all those people watching this and I pray that a Holy Spirit hedge of protection come down around you and over this video right now in Jesus' name. And I bind every spirit of denial, every spirit of unbelief, every spirit of anger, rage, unforgiveness, and insanity. I bind it right now and I rebuke it in the name of Jesus. And I release the spirits of love, peace, truth, wisdom, and understanding. I release them in all the people watching here in Jesus' mighty name. And it is written that every weapon formed against you shall not prosper. And every evil tongue spoken against you, I silence it right now by the name of Jesus. And every evil voice, that wicked voice that whispers in your ear, I silence it right now by the blood of the Lamb. And I release supernatural faith over you. Supernatural healing of your heart lord to soften their hearts so they may receive the holy spirit and they may receive jesus as their lord and savior i plead the blood of christ over you and i put on the full armor of god over everyone watching the shoes of peace the belt of truth the helmet of salvation the shield of faith the breastplate of righteousness and the sword of the spirit which is the living word of god and i ask that god give us a supernatural desire a supernatural thirst for the Bible and to read the Bible with understanding. And I ask that the angels of the heaven come down and minister to all those watching, to minister to them, to their hearts, and start to reveal truth and give them courage and confidence to go back and heal from the trauma and from the mind control programs that the enemy has put over our lives. Every mind control program I sever its tentacles over you. I rebuke it, I bind it, I excavate it, I uproot it from your life, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And it is written, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty, and I shall say of the Lord, you are my refuge and my fortress, my God, and you I trust. Thank you, Lord. May the Holy Spirit come down on you right now. May the fire of God, the Ruach Akadesh, come down on you and burn every wicked spirit that has you bound and chained. No more shackles, no more prisons. I rebuke these evil spirits in Jesus' name and I re release supernatural faith over you. Fill us with your faith that through God, through Christ Jesus, we can do all things in Christ who strengthens us. Thank you, Lord. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So let's step into this freedom. I see so much good happening to this world right now. There's so many miracles that are happening and more miracles coming. And it's time for God's people to rise up and take our authority. Thank you all so much. Part two will be coming out soon. My YouTube channel is called Lily Hubbard. And like I say, you can go and watch the first three parts of my testimony of why I gave my life to the Lord. I spent years searching for truth and traveling throughout Southeast Asia on the path of enlightenment. I was a practicing Hindu and I saw insanity. I thought, saw suicide and I witnessed murder from my occult practices, which brought me to the Lord. Thank you all. God bless you.